Good morning, Dr. Michael Fisher here. I want to focus today, I'm going to use the whiteboard to do a little bit of a teaching lecture summary of my understanding of what happened to the alternatives. And because if you know my work or know me, you know, you might say I'm a bit radical, you might say I'm kind of alternative, I'm marginal, I'm off on the edge, I think in between, I'm in the liminal space of the mainstream, and yeah, I, I have been for, you know, most of my life, and I've built a, quote, professional career out of that, even though I'm a professional educator by training in terms of formal education, in curriculum and pedagogy, I'm really an, a liberationist. I'm interested in, you know, the alternative to the system, systems that tend to dominate the worldview, the dominant worldview that tends to dominate and is creating, you know, I've argued in many of my videos, a system of ev inevitable collapse. I'm not the only one saying that, as you know, certainly people in the eco movement and various kinds of critics from the left and maybe even from the right at times of critique that the system is unsustainable, uh, unhealthy, generally where we're going. Sure, there's lots of good things too about what has happened in so-called world of progress and civilization, but we're heading for the brink. We're on the edge of tipping, as many have said. So I have different videos on that. Other people are as well. So I'm sure you as a viewer, if you're attracted to this video on the alternatives, politics and culture of fragmentation, as I'm calling it, um, I wanna talk about that notion of fragmentation within the alternatives movement. So I'm gonna use the white bird to do that. I'm gonna track through some of my experiences and some of my reading and just things that I've learned. So let's go up to the whiteboard. I'm going to use this for a while, so bear with me if I'm a little bit slow and sloppy with this, but let's just call it what it is. I was interested in this term just this morning in journaling that maybe the alternatives is the way to speak about um, all the various kinds of movements or social and environmental and cultural and spiritual change. And another way to refer to all of those really is transformation initiatives. So just a quick bio, I got into this you know, all for me personally. In my my biography, you know, I got in pretty heavy um, in my late teens. The eco movement, and that eco movement. Um, this will come back as quite significant. Um, in this talk and I probably will have maybe even have to do two. So I'm going to just juxtapose that now um, with another set of movements. So that's where I started and that was back in my youth. So we're talking in the early 70s. Um, but what we want to investigate under the alternatives is ego movement. Let me give you a little bit of theory for why I'm separating the eco and the ego movement. Um, very brief. Get the text box going. Um, I'm going to give Ken Wilbur's metaphysical theory. He calls it a theory of everything. And for me, that goes back to the early 1980s, 1981 in particular, um, and onward. I won't go into his work specifically unless it's relevant to the alternative, but this bit of metaphysical theory is important. Why? Well, because let's just highlight it. 
This is why, because I'm interested in praxis. So, right? Alternatives, we got look at my drawing tool. Got these alternatives. Very attractive for the changes that we needed, right? That's the key word changes at all these sort of dimensions that are out there that we can think of right down to the biological I could have put, but that's with the environmental. And we're interested in these changes as, as young people, certainly boomers were, and certainly people are today, young generations all come up and think, how can we change the world and make it a better place, right? But I'm talking all about alternatives, you know, versus, in a sense, or in contradiction to what we might call status quo or mainstream or tweakers. <laughs> The, the tweakers, the mainstream keepers, you know, they may want change too, and they want growth and development, but uh, they're only interested in just tweaking. The alternative folks, you know, are interested in, you know, a much big change. <laughs> okay, so let's keep that in mind. That's what I'm talking about when we come to the alternatives. And it's not just big. Um, Another word for that is they want a quality, a quality change, a big quality shift or change. All right, so keep that in mind. All right, back to Wilbur. I, I guess I'll draw the map that is most useful for me to understand his theory, which goes back to the 70s, actually, late 70s, when he was like 23 years old as a philosopher and an independent scholar doing an east-west synthesis, trying to understand the whole world, the right theory of everything, how to make this, understand this whole world so that we can move in a, uh, let's put that word down before I draw this. Uh, it's a quality of consciousness that, that is ultimately behind this alternative, this, this shift that's away from the consciousness of the status quo. So he came up with a kind of a map that, I'm giving you just a really rough idea of it. And so if you want more on this, you can let me know and I might go into it in more detail in a, another video, but just this is our intro to the alternatives and the problem of fragmentation. So you have this notion of development moving in this kind of direction and evolution. And, and basically it's the idea that, you know, there's kind of an upside to development what we call the the new emergent drive, the drive to go up, right, and to progress. And then he said, but equally, there's a drive, and this is kind of like built in, right, an instinctive built in formation or design to the, to development. And so that's kind of a key word here. We're talking about the development of a new consciousness of evolution itself. And how does that work on micro levels right up to the macro level of consciousness development and evolution? You would say there, there is this. And so then you put these interesting labels on and there's many labels. I'm giving you only one today. Um, so he called that a rising impulse or drive. It's almost like in a sense of a Freudian eros drive, if you will but he called it the ego drive. And that was, you know, the path of progress forward. But he basically said is that, and I really, this makes so much sense to me just aesthetically and sort of a, has a coherent resonance with me, is on this path. So if you think of yourself or an individual or an organization or a system moving along this path, um, you get to a point where you're taking in so much new and so many great new edge ideas and incorporating them, unifying them and synthesizing, integrating. But he, he always said there's kind of a threshold. Now maybe the threshold's here, you know, maybe it's back here, maybe it's here, here, where for various reasons of conditions of the environment and the development of the organism itself, there's, there, you, you hit a sort of barrier point where there starts to be more resistance to that new change, right? So you can see this is kind of all about new, 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 change, change, change. And 
it's great. It's a nice high, and, and I'm going to call it the ego high. He called it the ego path uh, of rising, and that's kind of related to like a mind, right? It's a mind direction. It's an interior direction of this ego, not thinking of ego in a bad way at all here. He's just using it as a term in contrast to, so let's get to the other side, um, is the ego path. And, and that's the return path. So he said, you know, everything will be fine on this kind of growth of development without the pathologies, without the developmental dysplasias or stalling or, you know, dysfunctions that we can get into obsessions on the ego, with the ego energy development striving. He said, as long as that ego path that we take, you know, allows for this kind of leveling off at this kind of threshold of can only go up so far this is the general ruler principle of development in the cosmos he would argue metaphysically and theoretically can only go up so far as a human in a body or an organism in a body you have to come back down and you just can think of so much of nature right is is about you can rise 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 up to the board the sun and eventually you have to return to the earth so, so if I was to make a big sphere here of attraction of pull of this drive, it would be a solar drive. And if I would put a big arc back down here, it'd be the earth drive. So I have more complicated diagrams than these, but this is good enough for today. So what he said is where you get into trouble in development and we get off the path, so to speak, this integrity of this path, is we go from ego drive to, we have to get back to the ego drive as well, right? Back to the earth, back to the return. So let me just put those levels, labels he had on that path, path of progress over here. And no judgments being made, not dissing the word progress as being all bad, um, not falling into that kind of quick labeling and trap that often happens in postmodernism and post-structure thought, and he said this is path of return. Again, I think this is just an elegant way to understand the really basic you know, whole system or an integral system. So uh, if I was to label that down here, he, he just called it integral. He didn't do that right at the beginning, back in the 70s and 80s. It took him a while into the mid 90s before he had this theory of integral theory. And that's the whole other uh, conversation, but that's what I'm drawing upon to understand the fragmentation of alternatives and why. Here's the key: the ego movements, movements, and I'm going to list those in a second on a new slide. What were those ego movements that I was involved in, uh, particularly starting in the early '80s? And that would be kind of the consciousness movements, the wellness movements, and so on. Get to that in a moment. Next slide. Um, he said those movements also became fragmented for various reasons. And then he said, and you know, great, there were the eco movements that returned us back to the earth, back to nature, back to green, right? That all that kind of discourse and formation of interest. Again, all trying to bring about change and development in a healthy, transformative way and trying to also resist and get beyond the status quo, which we saw as unsustainable, that whole sphere, right? It was like unsustainable. That ain't gonna work. Yeah, it's, it's un. Sustain. Unsustaining. Unsustainable probably a better way to just summarize all of those. So that's what we were working for, you know, sustainability and all that good stuff over here, more quality, life, life-centric, another term. Life-centered, all of the, this side of the alternatives, and some people you know, did label this as, you know, death-centered. And, you know, Freud is interesting, right? Because he, he sort of called all this side over here, these life forces, and now notice 
we're just getting a little more deep theory on life fo focus, um, which Freud called the Eros drive is fundamental in psychoanalysis and it's fundamental to thinking that goes back to Plotinus actually way back in Greek times and, and Wilbur has picked up on that kind of a neo-Platinal thinker. And there's the life drive also has this eco drive. We grow and then we decay and we need to come back or we grow certain levels and then we need to integrate all that new into the old and that's to bring it back to tradition. So there's kind of a politics in here, this move, right, of the new, the edge, the leading, the marginal, and then back to integrate with the status quo. So I'm not saying all the status quo, the mainstream is bad in pathology. That's just not an integral perspective, right? So there we are. You're getting my view. And a lot of people won't necessarily agree with this, but I'm just giving you a view. And then hopefully this theory will, as I proceed in the videos, be a, a good description explanation for this fragmentation of the alternatives and the politics and culture behind that. So they were still at this sort of abstract, sorry to be so abstract for so long. Um, I just really want to get this down because here's the word that I brought out was, I want to get a practice, a praxis, which includes praxis is made up of, in one direction, practice, practices that we carry out in the world, and it has the relationship to theory. And so you want your pra practices ongoing to relate to theory and theory to be modified by those practices. In our, in other words, our experience from these practices. So all social movements, all eco movements, right? Spiritual change movements, especially when there's a political edge to them and drive, and there is, um, they, they have to pay attention to that. And you know, that otherwise my argument is, is we'll get off track we're gonna lose a good healthy praxis in our work. And that's when I see the pathologies dysfunctions show up within movements, the alternative movements, right? And that's our focus, alternatives. So in a sense, this whole lecture is about, you know, uh, the alternatives. Okay, I'm gonna leave this. I think I can just clear this whole board. Clear all drawings and we're gonna, go to the, start with the ego. Well, I did say the ego, it probably doesn't matter which direction. These came later for me in my own personal life, ego movements. I'm just giving this category and so what are they? Well, first and most obvious to me was uh, the East-West synthesis consciousness that uh, came into certainly North America, if you weren't around, but it was, you know, talking the 60s, 70s, 1960s, 70s. And that's, you know, kind of my youth is in the 70s, all forward in late 60s. And that was part of a rebellion, right? Uh, that, that goes with that. And that's why it's an alternative. Because there's a rebellion going on to the status quo. We, we saw the unsustainability of the world. That's called the love generation, the boomers generation, uh, whatever you want. Um, so who else is in this ego's move, ego movement? Um, let's see, I guess uh, the one that really I got involved in as well started to come with um, interest in higher consciousness generally, and you can see that's certainly related to the East-West because the East brought in very much a interiority to the West and helped us see about higher, all these levels of higher consciousness. So we saw out of that higher movement, um, certainly meditation was the big one. Certainly there was explorations in the, the drug that altered, altered states of consciousness uh, movements. Um, sometimes called the transpersonal movements. Uh, and certainly the most obvious is sort of encapsulating a lot of that was the spiritual movements um, that were to bring us to greater awareness of an expanded sense of identity and self and place in the universe and that everything wasn't about small ego, right? So some way, capital E-G-O um, here. 
again, taking Wilbur's term for this. It's not about the small ego, it's not just about the self, but it is about, there is a relationship here in the large ego um, movement, the way he captures it. And again, I said the other word for that, let's just put the reminder up, is it's kind of the mind aspect of reality, ontology, the understanding of the nature of reality has this mind consciousness. So just always keep that in, my, in, in mind while I'm going through this list here. So back to, you know, just adding another couple movements that I got involved in. Um, often liberation movements were related to this, um, but probably more obvious to most of you as listeners will be the wellness movements. And that's the health movements, uh, the new health movements that were coming, wellness, well-being. And this became huge, these latter movements, particularly, just to emphasize, it was really these ones really took off. And yeah, sure, these ones did too. Eventually, they sort of were around earlier. And then this really took off in the 90s into the 2000s, and certainly is today, everything from yoga. Uh, mindfulness phrase, which we have now. I'm not saying any of this is bad, but the, the tendency is is that they become sort of everything for the movement, right? And so here, let me just say it again. So the ego movement represents a very large mix of movements, right? Which was the ego movements, as you remember on the diagram, were this, this drive downward in that theory, the integral theory I just showed in the last slide. And they are large and complex. And the other thing about them is to remember is to be healthy, those all those ego movements you need to have the arc to connect with, be integrated here, not separated, but to be integrated with the, that uh, ego, eco, uh, ego drive and eco drive. So to be clear, I think it might have been a little confusing. This is the ego drive here. We're going up. That's what we're talking about with all of these. And what Wilbur was saying in that integral model, and I'm saying is that the fragmentation of alternatives will come when we miss this, you know, here. And this becomes the eco on this side, right? The down, as I showed in the last slide. And it's when the either the eco think that they're all the best or these ego movements think they're all the best. So all of this here, if it gets what Wilbur used a nice word for it, it's not a nice word, but it's appropriate, um, they get arrogant and think that their way, right, the return way is, this return way is the best and is the all. So uh, that's all I was trying to show there. So one difference, as I said, these two are not the same. In fact, this is already in some sense a dysfunctional or a minor part of the greater other, which it's part of. And so he wants to keep those connected and healthy too. Yes, we're gonna go through some of this ego development in the self in our immature stages, but always keeping it linked to the larger ego, which is this basic fundamental drive instinct of the universe cosmos, arguably of development and evolution. So we've got some ego movements. Obviously these two really took off, became highly commercialized. And that to me is kind of the downside of it. The arrogant side of it is, is that people got off into this, 
so-called spirituality and they saw that was going to be their liberation they saw that was the higher the more advanced the morally superior and all this you know type of wonderful but stuff ended up becoming in my view a lot of feel good motivation and here's the one of the cruxes when we think in terms of political issues is that that feel good movement became you know fragmented from or dissociated from a gap was created um and this is called sometimes the spiritual political Marianne Williamson, um, who I've done a whole book on in the last two years, this book will be coming out in the summer, of the Marianne Williamson Presidential Phenomenon. She really goes after this problem of the eco camp. Right, sorry, eco camp. Wilbur uses this term and I kind of like it. He calls these the ego camp or the ego thought schools uh, of development. And uh, they, again, as I just reiterating, um, that camp focuses on the spiritual side of growth and tends to, at least in the West, because of so much of this becoming commercialized, everybody wants to do the classes and the mainstream, right? The, as I talked about, remember the, let's just call it the mainstream. They really um, got into integrating or appropriating would be an argument. All of these particularly, they like that stuff. And one of the reasons I'm arguing here from a political point of view, because remember this is about alternatives, this video, and it's about the politics and the culture dynamics uh, of what's happened to our alternative movements. And I think they need to be a lot of reclaiming going on because they got appropriated by the mainstream. Um, and there was a lot less rebellion. <laughs> it just wasn't so much there, the way these well-being and wellness, sustainability is not in this eco-sustainability. That's this, but the ego movements, they really got captured by people wanting to live longer, right? The obsession with youth, with health and wellness, and can I live forever? So it's like, to me, a lot of fear base in a good drive, right, or a good initiative for these alternatives just eventually became more and more polluted, and toxified by a fear based drive. And you probably want to know what its name is. I think it's cool. Wilbur comes up with it and the Eros upward drive, um, the fear side he calls. Uh, Phobos, not Eros, but Phobos as the fear based drive that goes with the ego path. Okay. Again, I wasn't going to get into all of that, but it's just worth mentioning because I have to make give an explanation theoretically of why these became less rebellious, more incorporated and appropriated by the mainstream which I also argue is a very fear-based mainstream. It's back to culture of fear and other terminology, but let's not get into that. So um, in that appropriation of these ego camp path, you can see spiritual, this is the kind of outcome, but divided or separated from, not that they're supposed to be separated in, in a good healthy integral model. And this is what again, Miriam Williamson to put her name down here she's such an advocate for it today i, I really appreciate her leadership and saying you know enough navel gazing you know it's fine to do all that good health wellness recovery you know addiction recovery work and so on to make ourselves healthy we have to be um, it's not bad we're not making it bad but it's why did it separate from political sphere so far and people didn't want as she says uh, people didn't want to be uh, doing the spiritual uh, and that was very positive 
and then thinking, you know, when you go into the political world, politics, it's just so negative, it's so down, it's so, you know, lower. Okay, you just heard two important terms. So another characteristic that goes with the drive is higher for ego, and the, then the ego camp will label lower. They make this distinction because they're always trying to go in higher consciousness, higher evolved, right? You can hear that drive. Again, not a bad drive. It's just when it gets off on its own track over here, it gets up so inflated, so driven, so obsessed. But you can see what it's obsessed with. There's a lot of good things here in the ego camp of thinking and thought. But when it gets split, when it gets arrogant, thinks it's better than everybody else, it's got this tendency to fall into a feel-good motivation. And that was because these movements were capitalized by capitalists. Capitalism took it over. Uh, it was a need, right? And needs can be sold. So that's very dangerous. <laughs> I'm going to move this. Oh, not going to move for me. Okay. Anyways, um, oh, don't want to go there. Let's just go back to the uh, higher and lower problem. Um, ego, again, wanting to go higher, doesn't want to go lower, doesn't want to integrate, is what I mean. And I say it doesn't want to go lower. And one of the reasons it doesn't want to go lower is that whole lower dimension of reality is kind of the earthly body side. And that's what we're getting into on the bottom part of this diagram. And then I think that's lots for today to, to give you some of the theory. Um, but I do want to go into so, some examples and I'll take the whiteboard off to have that discussion with you today. The earthy body part uh, to the lower and what you also get with that is uh, you get the pain part, you know, um, things hurt in the earthly body world. Sure, they hurt in the mind too, but uh, that's kind of easier to transcend. And that's what a lot of the ego camp is a kind of transcending upwards. And that's why I put transpersonal, you could have put transcendence there. And of course, yoga, mindfulness, a lot of those practices were meant to transcend the lower the body, the lower self, as they even call it. Okay, so enough on that. Um, tendency of the higher then can be to avoid the lower earthly body. And that's where the ego, eco people, go camp, they get pissed off. And they think that the ego camp people are too arrogant. And they think that the answer, the solution, is in the eco turn, is in the eco camp. All the values, all the good stuff down here, right? Green, one earth, nature. And that's their notion of where wholeness is found. A lot of the ego camp think wholeness and health is up here in the ego drive, and they're motivated by that, but here, it, in the larger integral picture is nature at this kind of materialist level. I'm just writing these out slower so that you can kind of really take this diagram in. It's a lot, I know, but it, in other words, it's actually quite simple to separate the material spiritual dimensions. And we've often seen this in philosophy and a lot of discourses and writers, critics over the ages of human history talking about how do we integrate the spiritual and the material planes and not make them divided. Because once you get them divided, then you get that fragmentation. And then culture and politics become separated and becomes all about the material plane, right? The spiritual plane. This is the critique here that came to the ego camp um, by Mary Williamson and others, myself included, Ken Wilbur included. Um, he was after a kind of more holistic or integral or integrative model. Um, what else do I want to say about politics? So 
Marion Williamson's argument in a nutshell, and I think it's a good one about what happened to the alternative movements that got hooked on the spiritual and left a lot of the political behind. Not all, but a lot of the ego camp movements did that. And I agree. I grew up in that. I knew those people. I was part of it. I probably was like that most of my life. I didn't want anything to do with politics. I just thought they were too negative, too dirty. It was too gross and too fear-based and just destructive and conflict and violence. And, right? So problem of you can't just split those worlds. That's, that's the point of this theory that will influence you know, good praxis in the future about alternative movements. So yeah, the political got uh, split off. So the great ego camp's criticism came and it went after the ego camp and eventually the ego camp went after the eco camp and said, well, well, you guys are all interested in, you know, this lower stuff and we're not, we're interested in the higher. And so they thought we were here, the ego camp. I was also part of that. And that's what I'm gonna go into in the next slide. Clear drawings. The eco movement part, um, as I said, it's the green movement, ecological conservation, preservation, nature, and a lot of what got into that was indigenous preservation of indigenous cultures the world view of the indigenous. So eco philosophers, eco thinkers are around today and that's their view of the alternative and sustainability movement. Heavily linked into that as well. And there was even such a strong drive on that eco movement, that return um, with a moral, ethical and a political edge to it in nature first. There was a whole movement, probably still around, Nature First, uh, animal rights people um, are part of this movement. Probably many more that I'm not thinking about in the moment, but this will give you a pretty good sense of what we're on to here. Um, and then you get, yeah, alternative energy movements, right, which are solar, etc. Good for the planet, right? Not more oil and gas. This is the post carbon thinking movement critics, and they're all critics. And again, the ego movement camps are also critics, but more in that spiritualist plane. Uh, these are more on the materialist plane, as I said. But I don't even want to put materialists down with us because a lot of these folks were also part of the spiritual ego movements too, but they focused and prioritized. And that's fine. They prioritize what they thought was most important, which was, you know, the earth isn't going to last. Like we're heading for collapse, ecological collapse. And there's a politics behind that. Well, what is the politics behind both those alternatives? So maybe that's just what I need to go to next. The alternatives that I'm mostly speaking to, ego and eco, um, ego plus eco, again, as rebellions, as resistance, as liberation movements, both of them have the, you know, that edge of possibility. They don't want just the static stasis that doesn't want to grow, wants to just preserve and fear-based um, dynamics. That's not going to help. It's not very creative. It's not very intelligent to what we need to do to adapt and change in healthy ways. So they both sort of kind of moved, um, what was I gonna say, not ego equals, I meant plus there. Put them together politically is where I was going is, this is the left, more or less, new left. It was with that that came later, and that takes us into parts of the critical schools. And you, you just got to know this stuff. If it's basic history, um, critical theory, um, critical philosophies. Um, I mean, 
Frankfurt School. Social theory. They were the foundations for, and you know, obviously goes back to 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 uh, the one that's most familiar to us in the West is you know Marxism as a complaint, right, or as a criticism. And then there's socialism, communism connected with variations on Marxism and so on. Um, but they're the critical schools of thought and they are part of the old left and the emerging new left. So that was great. Um, problem being was that there was a lot of fragmentation started to happen. In other words, parties, groups, movements started to split. So I'm skipping over this fast, but let's get to the, the green movement, which I watched. Let's go to the civil rights first. I've watched a lot of movies and I've studied a bit. I'm not a political expert and a historian by any means. That's not my bag. Um, as you know, I'm a purologist and I'm an educator. I'm attempting to understand why movements go the way they do and how to correct them through a, a much better, what I call a fearlessness praxis, integral informed by this kind of theory that I'm speaking about today rather than the fragmentation. So now we're getting into the battles, right? That's the key thing. If you're just saying, where's he going? I'm now going on what causes all this fragmentation and in socialism marxism communism capitalism there's always been fragmentations all ideological groups that have a particular they they split off um, the, the simple is um, you get kind of some that are um, more moderates in those movements and then you get the, sometimes it's called the more radicals. I mean, they're all radicals compared to the mainstream, but you get the radical, radical radicals instead of just the moderate radicals. And all of those are always in these movements. Um, I haven't figured out how to switch the letters around, move them around. And that came into basically why the new left, which was influenced heavily by so this was by social theory schools these critical schools of social theory really made up the politics for a lot of the left movements and again they're influencing both the ego and eco camp movements as well they're all interrelated and then the new left split off from them because they weren't happy with those old left social kind of politics and traditions and conformity. And the new left is also known sometimes as the new social movements. Some theorists have described in sociological cultural studies. And they were multiple. They tended to respond to issues. Um, so it would be Mothers Against Drunk Driving. It might be um, responding to anti-nuclear peace movements at times. Um, women's movements, all these different kinds of more issues based and or identity based. And then you get really fine grade um, trans, you know, movements, uh, queer movements, and abortionists, anti abortionists. I didn't tease a little off on the spelling. You get the idea. Um, and so you can see where the fragmentation is starting to come in this kind of postmodern period. Uh, more compared to a more modernist period. And I put down the civil rights as part of showing where this fragmentation was starting to happen again between moderate radicals. It really hit the civil rights movement in the 60s, 70s, um, from what I've watched. And that's really a good film to really see is the, uh, well, any film that basically you see Martin Luther King Jr. representing the more moderate um, leaders of 
the African American movement and Malcolm X. And the African centric movements uh, representing more radicals, um, um, less conforming, right? So these moderates, right, to within the civil rights movement, again, all part of the left, they really were, and they, I could use feminists, I'm not going to do the feminists, same problems of this fragmentation. Um, he was more for appropriation, he was more for forget it. Don't work with those people, they're, they're violent and they'll, they'll never uh, give us the rights that we need and dignity and let's do it ourselves. And that became you know, the offshoot, right? Unfortunately, both of them got assassinated because they're both radical enough to the mainstream. And so basically the mainstream said, we don't want those alternatives and we certainly don't want you to have power. If you want to just have a little power, well, we might let you have that for a while. And then um, the one I want to speak about more today that's really quite strong, I've been following it, the closest is the green movement. Um, this is alternative energies, right? And all this good eco stuff that, um, That movement is also split very heavily and has two labels. <clears throat> Some people label, I think, very useful is kind of deep green and green light. And these folks tend to be the techno solution. Um, and they are more, they think that the world will be saved by you know, green technology. And so Jeff Gibbs film, which I've done some videos on, I highly recommend maybe have a look at some of them videos on my channel. Um, he is the one that sort of with Michael Moore came out with this recent film, Planet of the Humans. If you haven't seen it, I highly recommend it. The Planet of the Humans came out on Earth Day 2020. And his intention was to basically really bring forward um, that he, Jeff Gibbs and Michael Moore, uh, Ozzy Zanner, they said the green movement is really kind of shattered and it's so fragmented and just full of conflict. And they would say full of a lot of bullshit because capitalism came in and from the mainstream and appropriated here. And a lot of people, a lot of so-called environmentalists, as Jeff Gibbs would use the word, Michael Moore would use those words, and it's a bit of a dissing of people who said, well, we can have green and we can still kind of live our lifestyle and you know, we'll, we'll solve the problem with technologies. And the film, The Planet of the Humans, really challenged that. So the deep and the light green are now battling it out with great fragmentation and it's splitting that movement just as it split the African and American movement and the civil rights, women's movement, et cetera. And my complaint, let's just go to one more example, was the, I'm just going to call it the, I grew up with, right, I went from the eco movements and then I moved more into the e ego movements. I didn't call it that at the time. It was this Wilbur's theory later helped me understand what was going on in my experience. And that's what theory is good for, the human potential movement. Uh, the 60s, 70s and that. Um, again, was heavily influenced with the spiritual movements. And I also got mixed in and traveled in the circles of the new age movements. Well, all of those movements, I was very critical of because I just had a lot of background and reading out of these critical schools. Um, and so I just kept breaking, you know, kind of a social political perspective, not heavily, but it was there. I just couldn't help it. I was interested in liberation and my, my path and what human potential was, was quite different than the mainstream of, I'm calling it mainstream, um, a lot of what the human potential became, even though it was alternative, it eventually became alternative mainstream. It was appropriated, it was integrated, just like, um, you know, the, the great health movements in the ego camp alternative health and the Eastern ways and Tai Chi and all these movements of Qigong and so on, they eventually just get appropriated and lose all their political edge. And that was that division I showed you between spiritual and political. 
And that's what happened to all these ones. They just lost their political edge and uh, became very feel good and, you know, good for me and I'm going to grow and be mature and healthy and I'm going to live forever. I'm going to be operating in higher connections with the cosmos and the esoteric teachings of truth and the real truth and capital T and the absolute and I'll be all divine. And I just continually was so disappointed with how they interact with the political work. Right? So that's probably enough for the stock share here that that's where this whole teaching this morning was. And I'm not sure if I'll do another video because I, I feel like, yeah, I really did get to a lot of the issues that I wanted to today. And politics has become so cultural now, culturally divided. Um, we just can't have a simple left and a simple right. It's not like that anymore, or liberals, conservatives. So my last contribution is I've been just reading uh, Ken Wilber's 1981 book, Up From Eden. Interestingly enough, Ken Wilber is now this integral philosopher, as I said, contemporary. I'm also a great critic of his and the integral movement that followed from him. And, even critical of the critics of that movement, but those critics are all in some sense healthy to have too. That's not the point I'm making, but so he came in 1981 and wrote this chapter in 19, and as I remember it so well, and recently been writing on it, is it was basically his theory of social, critical theory, critical social theory, um, based on his understanding of that integral map of Right, that movement I showed you, that deep metaphysical movement of ego, ego. And he just simply, and again, I'm really simplifying his work and the theory, but that's just for the purposes of this video. You can study that more and talk about it more. You can investigate your own. That, uh, that theory, he basically said, was to revealed at least three movements in political alternative movements and just movements themselves for change and development, even mainstream. Because we, we'd be much better off to understand politics, the political dynamics of the day, rather than get into the blame game of who's the problem with politics and who's crazy and who's not. Um, with this praxis theory, is much more nuanced to integrate and analyze the problems of politics today or the presidents or whoever corporate sphere is that there's a subjective domain there's an objective domain and there's the non-dual domain so that was his chapter 19 in that book 1981 the politics based on those three categories and he basically sort of said the subjective domain uh, tends to be the domain for the conservatives where they go after the problems with the world are basically because people are subjectively um, not acting appropriately and it's up to them and their interior behaviors to change and become good citizens and fit the norm. The status quo of the mainstream. And then the objectivists, which are more the liberal camp, the Democrat camp, uh, blames the system and the structures and the system, the objective infrastructure, the systemic uh, aspects and of course, you know, it's a bit of both, right? The subjective and objective interplay. But then what Wilbur does is he says, those are as valuable as those are, those political orientations. And they have some partial truth. And they have a lot of distortions because they tend to make themselves all arrogant. They, they want to put everything as a subjective problem, like the more conservativist thinking, Republicans, etc., generalizing. And, or they want to make it all objectivist and it's all about the system and, those infrastructures, materiality problems. And the left can get totally caught in all of that. Arrogance is again, when you just kind of go with one explanation or theory. And then he said the third element, the category is the non-dual. So ultimately, subjective, objective, and non-dual have to be functioning together as one. And I think his diagram basically is that. It's that movement on that diagram, as I showed in the first slide, that's the, the non-dual, it's, it's all one. It's just one non-dual movement. And then it has particularities, yeah, so ego, ego, subjective elements, objective elements on that 
map. No, everything doesn't fit on that map beautifully, and that's not reality, it's just a map. But the idea of that theory that I showed in the diagram, this notion that Wilbur's early work um, was focused around that, and I'll just end with his, he's got a chapter in a, in a book called Beyond Ego in 1993. It's kind of transpersonal di dimensions of development or something like that. It's the subtitle. And he's just got a chapter in it. I think he's maybe one of the editors too. And uh, I always love the phrase he, he said, really probably in the, after a big argument, politically he says, probably where we need to go is uh, mystical Marxism. Well, that's perfect. It was a perfect phrase for, and it's the only time he's ever used that phrase that I know of, and nobody cites that in the site Wilbur's work today anymore. The integralist movement certainly doesn't. And there, I want to talk about why that is a problem because he had, he did have it in his early, in the 80s, and maybe the early 90s. And by that time, he started slipping. So mystical Marxism, basically, right? It's, it's a spiritual, healthy ego. Um, rising, progressive, and the return, which is the Marxist, back to the materialist world as explanation, as understanding, and as intervention. And the whole healthy system, he says, would be a mystical Marxism, um, integrating the spiritual and the material. Okay, so what happened in the, that, and what happened in the integral movement itself of Ken Wilber's philosophy is just one example, and this happens all over, is it gets appropriated. It gets uh, institutionalized, tries to grow big, um, then gets involved in capitalism money. This has happened with the green movement, became marginal, and now it's trying to appropriate and work in partnerships with the mainstream. And the tweakers, the functionalists, compared to the criticalist schools, and that's where you get these fragmentation problems. Um, you get the green deep, right? Green light. You get the, what I'd call, integral deep, integral light. Ken Wilbur himself becoming integral light over time. And so I've always said I'm a Wilburian philosopher, thinker, theorist, but only up to a point um, to, to his earlier work. Once you get past you know, 93, as I said, he, he, he never used those words, critical social theory, he never used mystical Marxism anymore, he even indicated it. He just became really interested in this kind of post-metaphysical or functionalist model that he could apply to everything. He called it the old quadrant, all levels. But it it hides its politics, and I've been very critical of that, and probably a few others as well. All right, so that was my alternative take, and you get the idea. Alternatives, how they've been splitting and splitting off to ego and eco and deep and shallow and light and all stuck in identities politics is really huge today and so on and that's been critiqued as well so my promotion is that all those fragmentations are built on a fear-based dissociative based structure where they've lost the integral praxis theory right practices with theory I'm always moving back to remain in that non-dual connection that connectedness. And that would be a true integral politics for the day. Thanks. I look forward to any of your comments on this. Bye now.